Hi everyone and happy International Day of Peace. Welcome to the 24th NERPS webinar series on peace and sustainability in the context of global change. This is jointly organized by the IDEC Institute. Uh, my name is Dalia Simangan and I will be your moderator for today, one of the core members of NERPS. Thank you all for joining us both online and here in the room in person. To start, I'd like to invite our NERPS director, Professor Shinji Kaneko, for his welcome remarks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and this uh, uh, room here, and also a uh, participant online. Um, my name is Kaneko, I'm director of NERPS. Um, and welcome to you uh, for this uh, 21st uh, NERPS webinar. Um, we actually started uh, two years ago, exactly the same day of uh, International Day of Peace. Uh, we, we inaugurated this event uh, during the kind of difficult situation uh, in the pandemic. Uh, we try to expand our network and discussion on the emerging area of the nexus of uh, peace and sustainability uh, in this online uh, arrangement. And we successfully um, organized uh, almost once a month uh, uh, frequency. Uh, and then today uh, we, we came to organize 21st uh, NAPS webinar series. And at the same time, this is also jointly organized by the IDEC Institute as a uh, 31st uh, IDEC Institute webinar. So I, I appreciate uh, the colleagues from the IDEC Institute as well. Um, on this very special day every year, uh, we invite uh, uh, very special uh, speakers from different institutions. And this year, I'm very pleased and uh, highly appreciate uh, Dr. Vincenzo Bolettino from Harvard uh, University uh, kindly agreed uh, to speak to us about uh, his uh, rich uh, and very valuable experiences in Asia from from uh, United States and and share with us about the, the insight and perspective on the very uh, uh, special issues of uh, the nexus of peace and sustainability through the issue of uh, climate change and disaster. I'd like to also express my sincere appreciation to our old uh, colleagues and friends uh, all, all the way from Tokyo University, Professor Hibiki, uh, to also kindly uh, agree and accept uh, uh, to serve as a, a discussant. And also we have a very special also guest on site here from Nagasaki University, Professor uh, Fumihiko Watanabe from Nagasaki University. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to have a very special uh, audience uh, and also uh, a lot of uh, registered audience online. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to have a very fruitful time and discussion on this particular day. Uh, finally, I'd like to also announce uh, that the NAPS has another uh, flagship event, which is uh, NAPS conference that uh, we are going to organize here in Japan in 2024 from March 6 to 9 uh, at the Hiroshima University uh, to welcome all the kind of presenters and speakers from different stakeholders, uh, institutions, uh, not only academia, but also practitioners and decision makers and citizens. So uh, on this uh, uh, occasion, I also like to encourage and invite all of you to actively register. And registration places is now available online. So please visit our website and then uh, actively you know, uh, register and join the event in March as well. So thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Kaneko, um, for your welcome remarks. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to take this opportunity as well um, to announce that after this webinar, the first positive peace society in Hiroshima University, and arguably in Japan, will be officially launched. This society is a student organization created by our very own students here at Hiroshima University. And you, we hope that you will be able to stay um, after this webinar for that official launch. Um, and that's also in celebration of the International Day of Peace. Right, so let me now introduce our speakers. What I'm going to do is introduce our um, presenter and our discussant before moving on to the presentation. Our special guest, our speaker, as Kaneko Sensei mentioned earlier, is Dr. Vincenzo Bolettino. He is the director of the Program on Resilient Communities at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and research associate with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He has spent the past 20 years of his career at Harvard University in administration, in teaching, and research. And his current research focuses on disaster preparedness and resilience, humanitarian leadership, climate change, and civil military engagement during humanitarian emergencies. All of this we'll, we're going to hear uh, during his presentation. He earned his PhD in international studies and international security from the University of Denver. Friends and colleagues, join me in welcoming Dr. Vincenzo Bolettino. Thank you so much. It's such a, an honor to, to be here. I'm truly grateful uh, to both the faculty and, and staff at, at NERPS for inviting me. Um, I'm looking forward to presenting some of the research that we've done in the Philippines on disaster preparedness uh, and looking forward to your questions and engaging in a conversation about uh, the implications that climate change pose uh, poses for the globe, um, but it, it seriously, uh, serious implications for Asia as, as well in terms of uh, future preparedness for disaster and resilience towards uh, climate impacts. So I'll be sharing with you um, uh, presentation that I've prepared. Uh, hopefully you see this. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, uh, so my first uh, foray to the Philippines was in 2013, uh, just after uh, Typhoon uh, Haiyan, uh, which was the name, international name, uh, locally called Typhoon Yolanda. Uh, and I was there to look at uh, civil military coordination in response to that disaster. So looking at how international militaries were coordinating with the armed forces of the Philippines and with civil society organizations in the Philippines and international humanitarian organizations to provide um, relief uh, in, in the um, aftermath of that massive uh, typhoon. Uh, and a typhoon that was really um, a turning point, I would say, for the Philippines from um, having a, a, a rather reactive posture towards disasters and uh, thinking um, instead about what the implications are of climate change and how uh, the country could better leverage uh, government resources, private sector resources, and civil society resources to prepare for future disasters, given some of the challenges that uh, climate change were posing, uh, uh, was posing and, and was made manifest by um, the massive impact that Typhoon Haiyan had. Um, a little bit about uh, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, where I direct a program on resilient communities. Uh, we're an interfaculty initiative within Harvard University, and uh, we are administratively uh, and programmatically based at the Harvard H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health. Uh, our focus is on doing uh, research and education on disasters, on, on human, humanitarian action broadly, and on human rights and development issues as well. Uh, my program focuses on disaster preparedness and resilience, and I'm going to share with you some of the results of the research that we've been doing in the Philippines, uh, but we also have experience um, in, in Bangladesh, and we've also begun a program now in Nepal as well, all focused on disaster preparedness and resilience. So our core mission is to be able to bring research and, and develop an evidence base and to bring that to bear to really inform uh, how policies are, are created and to, and to inform the intervention strategies of government, of international NGOs and local NGOs uh, in terms of their own uh, preparation for disasters and how they understand the communities that they would provide services for, their, their, their views of uh, disaster disasters and their own experience with disasters. So our focus is really at looking at household level data 
trying to understand and get information about how Filipinos themselves experience disasters, how they view climate change, and what this means in terms of the overall preparedness system within the Philippines. Um, our, our core uh, vision is to be able to empower people um, at, the, at a very local level um, to enable them through information, through data, through research, to be able to better anticipate, prepare for, and respond to disasters, and to begin to adapt to and mitigate the impacts of, of climate change. So that's the core focus um, of, our, of our research. Um, all of this is done by a, a world-class uh, research team uh, that is based um, in part at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, but also, um, most importantly, um, with our cutting edge uh, colleagues in the Philippines who really spearhead our work and are very well connected throughout um, the disaster management and uh, response uh, system and know and can guide us uh, in terms of, of the work that we're doing. I'll also say that one of the things that we rely heavily on, um, in addition to our staff in the Philippines, is a research advisory group uh, that we've put together that represents a government, uh, civil society, national level, non-governmental organizations, and international NGOs. So we, we've assembled a research advisory group that we share our plans with, and give, they give us feedback on our plans. So we try to, to never do anything that is just concocted from outside. We really, anything that we do is based on um, addressing needs as they're identified at the national level and at the local level within the Philippines. And then we bring our expertise as a, as a global research group to be able to address um, some of those challenges and issues. And I'm going to share with you some of the work that we did based, based on a 2017 uh, nationwide survey that we did in the Philippines a household level survey that we did across the country that we'll, we will be repeating this year. So I'm really excited to um, be able to do this again and to be able to look at some of the, the changes um, that have happened over the past uh, six years, um, especially given the fact that COVID happened in between this period. Uh, when we collected this data, there were, that we hadn't experienced um, the global pandemic. And now that we'll be collecting data again, um, we will have gone through a couple of different administrations within the Philippine government, and we will have um, had uh, COVID as an experience in between. So it will be interesting to see how things are developing and evolving in terms of how people view, experience, and prepare for disasters in the Philippines pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So why the Philippines? Um, like Japan and other countries in, in, in Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, the Philippines is a country that sits within the so-called Pacific Rim of Fire. Um, it is subject to all sorts of uh, challenges with uh, natural hazards, um, most predominant of which is uh, typhoons. Uh, there are anywhere from 20 to 25 typhoons pass within the Philippines area of responsibility each year. Anywhere from four to five of those make landfall and cause significant uh, damage to property and sometimes regrettably loss uh, to loss of life as well. But the Philippines is also subject to massive amounts of, of flooding um, that are sometimes exacerbated by practices on the ground, especially with respect to um, uh, litter and trash and other things within waterways uh, that make the retreat of floodwaters uh, more challenging. Uh, the Philippines is subject to drought and non-climactic related events as well, including earthquakes and um, and volcanoes. All of this contributes to a pretty significant uh, level of vulnerability within the country um, to uh, a variety of different natural, national, uh, natural disasters and, and natural hazards. And so um, this is the reason that we're, we're focused on this because um, this is true in, in sort of the normal course of events for the Philippines, but given the fact that climate change is significantly exacerbating uh, these sorts of events and changing patterns um, and making things uh, more difficult um, to model and predict. Um, the Philippines is really in a in a sort of uh, difficult uh, position given its uh, geographic uh, uh, position and and where it is situated within Southeast Asia. And so it is really important to try to begin to understand what these impacts will mean for for the government and for the private sector and for civil society within that country. And that's why we're, we're uh, engaged in the Philippines and why we think 
that developing the evidence base is so important so that as policies are formulated and organizations are considering different preparedness measures that they can take, that it's informed by a real, a really rich understanding of how people themselves are thinking about experiencing and preparing for disasters. Now, I'm going to begin actually by um, cutting right to the key takeaways from some of the research that we've done. Uh, and then I'll get into sort of how we came up with these, these conclusions as we move through this, this presentation. So one of the things that we, we identified is that there's generally um, a limited amount of knowledge about climate change across the country at the household level. Um, generally, Filip Filipinos have, um, have a, a limited knowledge. And of course, this is very dependent upon um, wealth, upon um, educational background, um, where they're located geographically and their experience with disasters, um, people's ex knowledge of climate change varies considerably across the country, but on average, it's there, there was fairly low level of familiar, familiarity expressed with the, with the concept and how climate change is impacting the country. A second key takeaway is that climate change risks are not evenly distributed across the country. And this is probably no surprise um, this is true globally. This is certainly true in the United States where, where I live. Um, where you are, the amount of wealth you have, the level of education you have are all factors that contribute to your ability to prepare for and respond to and recover from um, disasters. And the same is true in the Philippines where there's a significant variation from one region to another in terms of Filipinos' preparedness uh, for disasters and their ability to um, manage the impacts of a changing climate. A third key takeaway that was really interesting, I think, from, from the data is that um, we noticed that there was a significant difference between what people expected, um, who they felt were responsible for uh, responding to and preparing for disasters, and who they actually experienced uh, as providing services when they were in the midst of a disaster or part of a, a, a uh, disaster themselves. So there's a real um, uh, difference between how Filipinos uh, think about responsibility for um, preparation for and response to disaster and who they actually experience um, providing assistance. And that that's really important for, I think, policymakers to understand and, and appreciate because it speaks to uh, the importance of awareness raising and communication, but also education and and um, uh, and and thinking about interventions in the future. Um, another key uh, takeaway is that um, only a third of, of Filipinos that we uh, surveyed across the country, uh, and by the way, the survey was uh, was nationwide. We did this across the country. It was a total of um, 5,184 uh, respondents across across the country that we, we surveyed at the household level. Only a third of Filipinos um, actually undertook measures to prepare actively for disasters. And the way we measured this was in, in three ways. Uh, one was their engagement in planning. So understanding whether they worked with their family or with local government or with, or with friends and, and others to actually plan for disasters. A second measure was around their engagement in training. So were they exposed to any kind of training? Did they receive any, any kind of official education or experience with disaster preparedness measures. And the third was in actual um, material investment in disaster. And a material investment in disaster uh, could was a, could really range um, from um, actually putting resources into their home to, for example, strengthen the roof or strengthen the home to make it resistant to typhoons. Or it could be things like putting together a go bag so that people were prepared if they needed to be evacuated with the materials that they needed, um, looking at putting aside um, food, water, and other supplies, medicines, for example, um, or safeguarding um, uh, important documents. So all of these were sort of material investments for disaster. So planning, training, material investment is how we've measured um, measures that were taken by families to, to prepare for disasters. And of those we, we surveyed across the country, a third of them engaged in one or a combination of those measures. Another really interesting finding is, is one that's more related to um, people's knowledge of climate change, but also interestingly to their own sense of self-efficacy. Um, 
That is their own belief that they can actively prepare for disasters. And what we noticed was that people who, uh, in the data, what we noticed in the data was that people who um, believed that climate change would impact their own households were far more likely to engage in preparedness measures than those who did not think that climate change was going to affect them. And similarly, people who had a sense of self-efficacy, who felt like they could make a difference, also actively took measures to prepare for disasters, um, which is really important because it shows a link between um, self-awareness, um, one's psychological well-being, and active engagement in disaster preparation, which um, is something that we really want to explore um, going forward. The, the, the final um, sort of observation that I'll make is that there's a strong link between preparedness for future disasters and climate change adaptation. It makes very little sense to prepare for what is invariably going to be repeated disasters and potentially worse disasters in the future without actively including in those policies ways of adapting to climate change. Um, and so this is something that we're trying to look at both at, at a community level, but also in the practices of national NGOs and international international NGOs, so that they're not only preparing to respond, but as part of their response, they're preparing those communities to better adapt um, to uh, future threats. All right, so how do we measure preparedness and, and resilience more broadly? So as part of the survey instrument that we created, we looked at a variety of pieces of information. We looked at information and communication. So where do people get their information? What information do they trust? Um, uh, where, you know, how frequently do they access it? What are the sort of mediums that they use to get it? Is it by, through internet? Is it through, through mobile devices? Is it, is it um, through television or radio? Um, so looking at people's um, source of information and their trust in the information is one component of resilience that we looked at. A second piece was looking at their previous experience with disaster and trying to understand how previous, previous experiences informed their own practices to prepare in the future. The third is to look at their economic capacity, to look at the sort of livelihoods component, and to look at the, the natural resources and environment in which they live. Clearly, uh, depending on where you live, whether it's coastal or inland, whether you have greater resources or fewer resources, all of these things are going to impact your ab ability to effectively prepare for future disasters and to adequately adapt to some of the challenges that climate change present. We also looked at security and, and the link between people's sense of um, safety and security, um, understanding that the Philippines is a varied environment. There are some areas of the country that uh, experience ongoing latent and sometimes um, uh, active uh, conflict for a variety of different reasons, particularly in the um, uh, southern region of uh, uh, Mindanao, uh, and and how security is is interlinked with environment, climate, and and how those things impact um, people's views of their own um, well-being and how they think about and prepare for disasters. Uh, we looked at governance and leadership. Uh, we looked at the impact of community leaders and how. Uh, uh, engagement with with community leaders impacted um, preparedness within communities and how their own trust in governance um, uh, impacted their own views on preparedness. And then finally, we looked at measures of social cohesion, that is level of engagement um, within the community amongst members uh, with, with one another, and how looking at um, people's uh, own uh, sort of efforts to engage in their community uh, were related to their own preparedness measures. And one of the things we found is that people who are involved in community-based organizations or who are actively engaged in their in their community were more, were more likely to prepare for and be prepared for disasters than those who are not. Um, some of the findings from this, uh, uh, I'll, I'll provide some of the um, bigger picture findings from, from the survey. Um, we found that, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that, that Filipinos had expressed very little knowledge about, um, about climate change and climate change impacts broadly. Um, nearly 60% said that, that they had little or no knowledge of, of climate change as a, as a, um, as a, as a 
a factor influencing their their lives. And this is something that we're really curious to look at how that's changed given the sort of proliferation of information about climate change globally um, and the and the huge number of uh, climate related disasters that we're seeing on a basic, almost a daily basis all around the world. Um, very curious to see whether that has really led to an increase in knowledge amongst Filipinos about their own vulnerability to the to climate change. Um, as I mentioned earlier, where you are, your level, your your background, your economic wealth, your social um, capacity and integration really, really influence um, your own uh, ability to prepare prepare effectively for disasters and your own knowledge of climate change. So we looked at the. Um, uh, Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, which is one of the um, more economically deprived regions of the Philippines, and and frankly, a region that also experiences quite a bit of both latent and active conflict, and has only recently uh, gained autonomy. Um, that that is an area where there is very little um, uh, expressed knowledge of climate change, and and sadly, very little uh, uh, capacity to to deal with and cope with. Um, the impacts of, of climate-related disasters, which is in part a function of limited economic uh, capacity and, and, and uh, pressures on livelihoods, but also uh, the result of um, the impacts of, of active uh, conflict as well in the area. When we asked um, what structures or what things were most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and the impacts of, of disasters, um, not surprisingly, far and away, most people said that it was their their actual homes that were um, at risk. But they also cited a high level of of vulnerability of uh, primary uh, livelihood sources like farmland um, and uh, transportation networks and and road networks. As I mentioned earlier, um, we asked Filipinos, and this this I think is really interesting information, um, and I'm very curious to see how this changes when we do our next um, survey. Um, but we asked Filipinos whose role it was, who they felt um, uh, was responsible um, for responding to a disaster, and overwhelmingly um, they uh, reported that they felt it was the local government units, and this is a this is the uh, sort of, you've got national level, provincial level, uh, municipal level, and local government units in the Philippines. And most people felt that it was um, the responsibility of their own local government unit to respond to and prepare for disasters. Similarly, they felt um, that the national government also had um, a significant responsibility. They didn't feel like, um, th th while they did cite that their families had a, a responsibility, they didn't really um, cite uh, uh, a responsibility amongst civil society organizations to be prepared for and respond to disasters, um, which is quite interesting. Um, this, it, and we see almost uh, a similar breakdown for preparation, although there are more people leaned on family to be prepared for disasters as, to, as opposed to having a responsibility for responding. But again, they, they, they cite civil society organizations um, as having a fairly low responsibility for preparedness and really put the onus on local government, national government, and family for preparedness. Now, contrast some of this with when a natural disaster actually happens, who they actually receive aid from. And overwhelmingly, who they receive aid from is are their own families, um, their own community members. And much higher percentages here um, say that civil society actually provides a response. So while they actually feel that government should be responsible for preparedness and response, not civil society, um, it's actually civil society that's playing a large role in preparedness and response in terms of what they act, what Filipinos actually see when a disaster happens, um, which is quite interesting and, and really, I think, speaks to the importance of communication and awareness raising and education, um, because there's a, real, there's a real divergence between people's expectations and their actual experience. Um, I, I want to make a point as well. When we look at these, um, I, I mentioned that we looked at um, preparedness measures across three um, sets of activities, engagement and training, engagement and planning, and, and material investments. Um, there are two things that are, that are striking here. One is that there are fairly low 
levels of engagement and training and planning, um, slightly higher in terms of material investment at the national level. But if you look at the, um, the difference across the regions, these are really striking. So looking at um, uh, engagement and training, nearly 41% of respondents in the national capital region of the Philippines, that is where Manila is based in the, in, um, uh, in, in the Manila metro area, um, 41% of, of people, 41.7% had engaged in some form, at some level of training. Only 3% in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao um, had engaged in training. So again, you see real variation um, based on where in the Philippines you are in terms of your engagement in training. And this, and this kind of variation, I, I, gave, I give two extremes here, but this kind of variation is true across all of the regions of, of the Philippines. Um, looking again at, at like material investments, you can see um, that, uh, again, the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, where there's um, a, a lower level of um, economic capacity, um, great, great reliance on, on agriculture um, and ongoing conflict, they have much lower um, uh, capacity to invest in or engage in preparedness measures. And this is really problematic because this is an area where um, people are having to deal with um, both both conflict, but also shifting um, uh, climate uh, events and increased um, exposure to climate related disasters. So now you've got communities that um, may have only a tenuous claim to land, especially amongst indigenous uh, communities, um, who uh, are now experiencing both um, the impacts of climate uh, change and conflict at the same time. And this creates enormous pressures on um, on forced migration and pushing people uh, out of the area as it becomes more and more difficult for them to sustain livelihoods, sustain agriculture um, in 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 light of both having to deal with the impacts of uh, active conflict as well as uh, things like flooding, which are which will destroy um, crops and their own investments in their in their um, agricultural production. Um, finally, um, based on all of this research, I'll say that we found four overall factors that really um, contributed positively to disaster resilience. Um, one is that where people had access to quality services, resources, and information, they expressed a much greater um, ability and capacity to recover quickly from disasters and prepare for future disasters. Um, where they had effective access to social safety nets, particularly in areas where the livelihoods were higher, um, that economic activity was greater, also similarly um, contributed to resilience. I mentioned the importance of self-efficacy before, um, where people feel like they have an active role and can actively engage in mitigating the, the impacts of disasters, that they can actually take steps to do things to prepare for the impacts of climate change. Though people who felt that way actually actively engaged in and took steps um, uh, to, to prepare for uh, future disasters, both through engagement and training, planning, and material investment. So all of these things uh, contributed to a much greater sense of uh, preparedness and resilience in the country. Um, so looking forward, um, we will be conducting another uh, nationwide survey this year. We'll uh, look to see how things have changed over the, over the, or evolved over the past six years. But simply to say that, um, I think at, at the end of the day, it's really important to not only look at some of the quantitative measures of, of looking at how uh, climate change and other uh, climate related disasters are impacting economy and um, ability of at the national level to prepare for disasters, but really looking at trying to understand how people themselves think about uh, disasters, what their concerns are, what steps they're taking um, to engage and prepare so that there's a greater link between what national government and local government are doing with what people actually experience, see, uh, and do uh, so that there's a, a greater um, unity of effort that translates local experience into both um, local policy and national policy. So I will stop there. Um, I've spoken for just over uh, a half an hour. Um, and I think we will move, um, I, I guess, to Professor Hibiki, who is uh, the discussant. Um, and then I'm looking forward to uh, any questions 
uh, and uh, discussion that you'd like to have on these research findings or other related um, topics. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bolettino. Um, what a quite enlightening um, presentation. Um, I'm a Filipino. I'm originally from the Philippines. Um, I, I think some of the audience um, who are also from the Philippines um, share the disappointment about the inaction of our government, especially in terms of the gaps that um, the government uh, provides and the community needs. But at the same time, it's quite encouraging that um, everyday people, you know, your family members, your neighbors, are, are there um, in times of disaster. So the the issue of empowerment um, quite striking for me. I think that's one thing that we have to work on really in the Philippines. Right, thank you so much. Um, let me introduce our spe another special guest, our discussant, Professor Akira Hibiki. He is the head of policy design at the Graduate School of Economics and Management of Tohoku University. In the past, he served as president of Society for Environmental Economics and Policy Studies um, he also held positions at Sophia University, where uh, he obtained his PhD, the National Institute for uh, Environmental Studies, and Tokyo Institute of Technology. His current research focuses on the economic impacts due to climate change in Japan and some developing countries, uh, including Vietnam, Panama, Kenya, and others, and also the health impact of outdoor pollution and indoor pollution in Bangladesh. Professor Hibiki, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Akira Hibiki from Tohoku University. Um, okay, uh, I appreciate having an opportunity to discuss such uh, interesting research. I'm also interested in the in this the field in this field because I'm working to explore how we can mitigate the impact of power outage caused by the natural disaster and how policy can complement the individual preparedness. So in order to discuss, I read his paper <laughs> published in the internal journals. Then I thought I discuss the content of his research. But uh, so I pre uh, my today's dis uh, discussion is relatively technical. Then uh, almost discussion is, uh, is for uh, his papers, which he does not <laughs> talk today. Right, so I don't know whether I should keep, uh, I should continue my discussion. Yeah, uh, let me try to discuss uh, his about his paper because this is very interesting. So please uh, go ahead, uh, please move. Next, please. Uh, as he's already mentioned, uh, the reason why he conducts this research is less is known about how public awareness affect, uh, if affect preparedness against natural disaster risk in the context of developing countries. So the purpose of his paper, he, go, he went beyond today's presentations. What he did, did is uh, he explored how public pre, uh, perception, knowledge, and past experience of natural disaster affect preparedness against the risk, right? So in order to uh, analyze such issues, he used a met, uh, like a, a regression analysis, analysis to understand the causality, right? Then which which variables are right to explore, and he explored which variables are really likely to affect preparedness. So his main findings are the majority of Filipinos are not well informed or well recognized about climate change, and also the knowledge about climate change is low. So he is today. He explained such a thing today. That then for the from the uh, his analysis, uh, risk perception, uh, awareness, the past experience of the natural disaster, and educations uh, positively affect the preparedness. So this is uh, this research is importantly explore uh, the status of the preparedness in Philippines as a, one of the case studies on the developing countries and consider optimal policy design to mitigate the damage or enhance preparedness. So next please. So uh, this comment is related to his paper, not this, today's discussion at uh, this pre presentation, uh, please forgive me. So uh, in one of his, uh, uh, so one, uh, 
he, one of his finding is uh, research perception have different impact on preparedness, uh, meaning affecting make, that he, he has uh, several outcomes for preparedness. One is the general preparedness. The other one is uh, making plan to mitigate uh, the natural disaster risk. And also the other thing is, uh, I mean, uh, material invest, uh, whether they implement material investment, right? To strengthen their house or to mitigate the damage when he encounter uh, their uh, natural disaster such as typhoon. So, uh, so, so in his findings, the risk perception has a uh, different impact on preparedness. For example, like uh, it affect making the plan, but not material investment and training activity, right? So why uh, the, uh, it, such, a, uh, such a, like a different impact occurs? That first question. So the other thing is, uh, I mean, so, so why, uh, so in his findings, climate change impact on household are uh, different from uh, like, uh, like a climate change impact general, general means society, right? So people can understand their uh, climate change impact as well as Im impact on society, even though they do not encounter uh, their damage. But um, so uh, such, such an impact is uh, likely to affect their decision-making but uh, are there any good reasons why such uh, such a diff different impact affect the different uh, like uh, decision making? So, because for example, his finding is that climate change impact in household increase uh, preparedness, making plan, but not material investment and train activity. On the other hand, climate change impact general for society affect making plan and material investment, but not general preparedness and train activities. So why this difference occurs? Next, please. So um, next comment is uh, preparedness depend on the local location and its geographical correlations. Uh, they're ge geographical correlated. So, so how is it correlate with the actual frequency of the event of natural disaster? actual frequency of the event is likely to affect the local government policy measure uh, against the natural disaster, which is uh, unobserved in this study, but affect uh, preparedness. In this case, it may be a good idea to control a spatial or correlation. Maybe this is too technical, but <laughs> sorry about it. And also in his paper, uh, he, he obtained a very important, um, I mean, uh, findings, but uh, maybe uh, the uh, like uh, variables to affect the preparedness maybe depend on some uh, variables. For example, uh, such an impact maybe depend on rich and poor, or such impact maybe depend on uh, uh, urban versus rural, or minority or majority, right? Or different educations. So are there any, uh, maybe it may, you may not uh, analyze it, but uh, uh, are there any possibility that the heterogeneous uh, impact is heter heterogeneous? Okay. So the last uh, comment is um, uh, you, you obtained the very Im important findings, right? Uh, for, from the previous studies on develop de uh, uh, very important findings. But uh, uh, I would like to understand uh, how your findings are different from the finding in the previous studies focusing on developed countries, and also how such a differences uh, occurs. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, let me mention about one thing about the power outage caused by natural disaster, um, uh, since it is important in the context of, of developed countries, though it is it is uh, beyond his, his scope. However, it might be possible research topics in the context of the de uh, de developing countries, right? Because long hours power outage caused by the natural disaster affect human life. For example, if a uh, power outage occurs, we cannot use electricity. That is why we cannot have a water uh, supply. And also we may not be able to use air conditioners 
uh, which cause health damage, such as heat stroke. And also, uh, people cannot use medical equipment used in the house for people who need some medical remedy. So uh, power outage caused by, lo uh, long hour power outage uh, caused by natural disaster has a significant impact on society. So if it, it is also important for the different countries, it may be important to establish large scale local system of uh, restorage battery for the future adaptation policy to support complement their uh, individual uh, preparedness. So uh, uh, this is just just a my uh, my idea. So this is a case. But this is a how, how does it of outage frequency per year per sold in 2018, right? In, for Japan and uh, New York, California, Germany, France. So in 1966. Uh, average frequency in Japan was 4.85, but uh, later, maybe because of economic growth and or, or technological progress, the frequency become dramatically dropped, like a 0.94. So, but this is the outage durations, minutes per year, household in 2018, right? So 2018 in Japan, average, uh, minutes is 225, but when uh, we we uh, encounter um, Great East Japan earthquake, if such a big earthquake occur, the, uh, we have much longer uh, outage, such as 514, right? So uh, for general outage, uh, uh, hours for the general outage is, is fine because it's it's shorter. But uh, once such a big uh, even happened, the long, we, we encounter a experience, very long hours uh, outage, which will be damage the people. So such a thing may, is occur in Philippines or not, or if this is very serious problem, maybe for the future uh, uh, research, it may be considered uh, to research how such a outage affect their, um, I mean, life. And also, it may be interesting to consider the policy to promote like a, 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 a local uh, system of uh, uh, like a restoration battery system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Hibiki. These were really excellent comments, and I really appreciate this. Uh, this feedback. I'll see if I can can cover um, at least some of what you you brought up. Um, it, this is a cross-sectional survey, and so it is. There, we can't really demonstrate caus causality, and we can't really explain why, under certain circumstances, for example, people who feel that climate change is going to impact them, their own households, why they would engage in planning and training, but not in material investment. We would, we would be speculating uh, to come up with an answer. But one of the things that I would like us to do as we're moving forward, you know, we probably don't have um, the means to, to create a randomized control trial. We, we're not going to be able to do something um, at the national scale at a national scale that's going to be able to create a model that's going to allow us to um, demonstrate causality. But one thing that we can do um, is look at uh, the associations that are statistically significant and go and do qualitative research. Speak, go back and speak to people and ask them to interpret the findings and explain to us what, why are these things true? Or can, can, you, can you share some inferences or share some insights about why these um, associations have, have emerged uh, in, in the data? So that's what we, we try to do. That's difficult to do at a national level. You can do it at, at a more local level to try to interpret the data. And that's, that's some of what we do to be able to explain some of the the variations that you brought up, but from the data itself, we we can't you know we can we can say whether or not the association is statistically significant, but we can't say why people engaged in one activity and not and not another. Um, um, you mentioned um, frequency of exposure to to hazards. We we did ask how many disasters in the past five years people were exposed to. But we didn't find a, a statistically significant association with with frequency. We did in terms of whether they are exposed to or not exposed to a disaster. Um, but in the Philippines, almost everyone has been exposed to some type of natural hazard in the past five years. I mean, there's there's virtually 
uh, almost no one has not experienced some kind of flood, some kind of typhoon or something in the past, past five years. Um, we didn't find any uh, statistical significance uh, in terms of variation uh, in, in preparedness activities between urban and rural communities, surprisingly. Um, in terms of power outage, that's not something we I've thought about, and that's a, you, that really raises a really interesting point. I don't know that I, I think that's some data that we could get probably from the national level, and and try to look at how that's associated with um, different uh, what people's actions are. But we did ask about things like whether or not people had generators, um, but I didn't look at pulling in data like national level data from the Philippines on on frequency of power out out frequency of power outages and their duration. And that's a really interesting idea and, and something um, that we could do this next time around, which I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, I, I think that's important and, and not something that that we've done. So thank you so much for for uh, for that feedback. Um, I tried to pull out the associations that I thought were most interesting from the paper, but I didn't cover every single um, association that's in the paper, especially around things like links between uh, livelihoods at level of education um, and and their connection with uh, different preparedness activities. Thank you, Dr. Bolatino, and thank you, uh, Hibiki Sensei, for those crucial interventions that, that really complement well with the presentation by uh, Dr. Bolatino. Um, we have almost around 30 minutes for open discussion. We already received several questions from our online audience and even during the registration, but I also encourage those who are participating here in person to, to ask your questions or even share your you know, uh, comments and reflections. Um, let me start, uh, while you're thinking uh, about your questions, let me start with uh, some of the questions that we have received during the registration, uh, Dr. Bolatino, if you don't mind. I'll just read a couple of them. And then we also have questions, especially from our um, um, colleague, Dr. Hassan Virji, who is also joining us online. Um, this first question is from Kevin Bautista of uh, the University of the Philippines in Diliman. And he asks, are there any government policies around data, communication, or journalism that will help Filipinos learn from and prepare for future climate change related disasters? This is the first one. I'm going to ask the second one. And the second one is um, from Hiroshima University, Bisma Anskaya. What is the role of the military on climate change induced disasters um, in the Philippines? Um, is it okay, uh, Dr. Bolatino, for you to answer those two questions first? Thank you. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, on the first one about um, uh, uh, disaster management policy and, and its relation with uh, communication, I, I mean, we, we have in the Philippines the, the 2010 um, Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act that, that sort of stipulates and governs um, the role of the National Disaster Risk and Reduction Management Council and the different levels of government responsibility for both preparedness and response. Um, in terms of how that links into journalism, I I don't know if there's a if there, to be honest, I don't know if there is a, a, a element within the act that that speaks directly to to journalism. Um, I know that it's differentiates different roles and responsibilities of of different government actors um, and and ministries, um, but I would say that there is a rich. Um, uh, amount of journalism in the Philippines that happens around around disasters. There's no lack of of, of information. Um, and um, increasingly, especially Filipinos are actually very uh, active on on social media and, and the like as well. So they're also reporting on 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 local uh, disasters as well. So um, probably not a not a you know it doesn't really fully answer the 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 question um, on the in terms of the role of um, the military. So in the Philippines, as in many a uh, number of countries in in Asia, the armed forces of the Philippines has a plays a prominent role in in major um, disasters. Um, it's if the local government unit can take care of um, of of a particular natural hazard, that's sort of the default. Um, but if it is a disaster that rises to the level of needing national capacity. Um, the mili military does play um, a si significant role. Um, and we saw that certainly in, in Typhoon Haiyan, not only the, the AFP, but also international militaries as well. And since then, um, not there haven't been international um, 
uh, intervention to uh, um, to respond to disasters. The Philippine government since 2013 has been solely responsible for it. They haven't that requested international support since then. Um, but the the AP does play a primary role, and and this kind of becomes a difficult, I think, consideration probably for <clears throat> the government because, you know, ideally you have you rely on civilian agencies to do things like disaster response. Um, and that you train a, a strong cadre of civilian agencies to be able to prepare for and respond to disasters because it's the primary role of most militaries to defend um, the, the country and not necessarily to have a military set up in order to, to do nothing but respond to disasters, even if in practice, militaries do do that frequently. Um, but I would I would say that it it makes more sense um, thinking about um, some of the risks that that climate change are are are, are now um, uh, playing that the military try to look at its primary role in defense as opposed to um, trying to create increased capacity to respond to natural hazards and instead to to invest in civilian agencies, rely on local community organizations, and really put money into the hands of um, civil society and rely on private sector as well to really bolster that capacity um, for preparing for. Uh, and and I would enhance. I would definitely um, also um, suggest that the preparedness measures are even more important than preparing to respond because we know that we're going that in the Philippines you're going to have to respond all the time. So if you can mitigate the costs of and the impacts of disasters in the first, first place, then you can lower the cost of response. And ideally, that response is really run by civil society organize, organizations, civilian government, and not not have to rely um, so heavily on on the military. That that would be that's my personal um, view. Thank you, um, Enzo. I think when it comes to the information as well, there's a big issue in the Philippines about not just misinformation, but also disinformation. So the first question kind of related to that as well. And in terms of military's uh, role, again, the variation in in the regions, right? The Not everybody has the same uh, perception of the presence of the military, like in the yeah. Baltimore region, even though yeah. the military will be able to respond, the perception will be very different from the northern part of the country. Uh, yeah. ab absolutely. No, no question. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask some of our attendees um, in person, if you have any questions, you may just raise your hand and our support team will um, give you the microphone. You're still thinking about your questions. All right, so we, right, okay, we have over. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, this is Rohan George from the economics program here at Hiroshima University. Uh, thank you very much for that for the presentation. Uh, my own research area is on the impact of glacial lake outburst floods in Nepal. So kind of related to, to some of the stuff that you spoke about just now. Um, I'm interested to know, in terms of your research, have you come across some of uh, some of the adaptation strategies like migration of people in the Philippines uh, as a response? And is it even possible given the density and geographical location of the Philippines? And I just had a quick comment as well that I'm not surprised to see that 60% of people were not aware of climate change, because even in my own discussions with people in the general public, uh, you know, maybe maybe two or three out of a hundred people have have some recognition of this, so it's not surprising. It's quite it's quite uh, it's quite concerning to me as well. But uh, thank you. Uh, no, thank you so much. Um, uh, well, for one, I would uh, I would love to I would encourage you to reach out to me um, when you get a chance because I'd love to hear more about your research, especially since we are now um, starting to do research in Nepal as well, and we're looking at where we can have the greatest impact, and, and we're likely to focus on at a more local level as opposed to doing sort of the nationwide work that we've done in the Philippines. Um, although we're still very much in the nascent stage of, of figuring out where, where we can have the most um, impact and where it would be the, the most useful. So I'd love to hear more about your, your own work in Nepal. Um, yeah, it's, I you know, to, to be honest, it's like, it, it, it it's difficult to say in terms of like, um, uh, it, it is alarming um, that, that, People aren't as as aware as you you think they might be, and I, it's hard to imagine that over the past six years, people haven't become increasingly aware. 
um, particularly given Filipinos' access to social media and to, to television, that they're almost literally, I mean, every day it seems that somewhere in the world there's some impact of climate change that's just bizarre in terms of um, precedent uh, in, you know, whether it's fires in Siberia or California or or Hawaii, um, whether it's droughts or or major flooding. I mean, look at Libya, like uh, these things are just like uh, off, it's off the charts and it's really difficult in, to, to predict and model this. So um, I think that, you know, increasingly there's got to be more um, uh, attention that's paid um, to uh, improving communication, education, awareness raising, and really tying people's local um, experience to local policy and, and intervention so that there isn't a mismatch between what people are expecting to happen and what people and what government is actually investing in and preparing to do. I don't know if that fully answers your your question. Yeah, yeah, and, and sorry, if I can just ask, have you seen any evidence of migration of people? That is not, oh, migration, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew I missed something. Um, that one is difficult. Um, it, it's really hard to say because it's mixed in with so, so many different things. I mean, Filipinos move around a lot um, for economic opportunities, but also as a result of, of, of exposure to um, both natural hazards and, and conflict. Um, and it's difficult to know... Um, there, there are some decent studies out there that have been done by, um, I believe, the International Organization of Migration um, and maybe UNHCR as well, um, looking at migration. And it is a factor, but it is likely to become much more serious of a, of a, of a factor um, in, in the future. Um, and um, yeah, and, and to, to the extent that, that it's true, that it's national only in character versus international will, will be interesting to see as well. But there's no question that there is some link between exposure to natural hazards and, and migration. There was a huge migration outside out of um, uh, Tacloban after Typhoon Haiyan uh, of refugees being a bit, well, they're not refugees, internally displaced persons being moved um, to Manila and elsewhere out of uh, Tacloban. And the question is how many of those people then sort of returned to the area versus permanently moved and whether they then that get displaced again. Um, one thing that's definitely true, and we saw this with COVID as, as well, is that it is much more difficult for marginalized groups, um, whether they're marginalized economically or socially or politically, um, for them to be able to uh, find the resources to be able to stay. Um, th and they're more likely to be um, displaced um, than people of economic uh, means who are not otherwise marginalized. Thank you, and so and thank you, Rohan, for the question. That there's a networking opportunity here, so you will hear from Rohan and Zo uh, soon. Um, right, unless we have more questions from the floor. I'd like to um, raise question, two questions um, from our online attendees. The first one is from our colleague, uh, Dr. Virgi. Um, and I love this question because most of the stuff we talk about are the negative consequences of you know all this um, phenomena. Um, but Hassan's question is about um, sustained peace. Um, if you could comment on specific examples of communities who are deemed to be resilient to disasters, what are their practices and how are those practices also promoting peace, um, assuming that they are, you know, this dynamic, collaborative and adaptive practices? Yeah, I mean, I, the term, for example, resilience in, in the first place is, is can be sometimes problematic and contested. Um, some people get really uh, frustrated with its use um, because they feel like um, it is shirking responsibilities of governments or others to provide services. Um, and they, you know, just because they're able to survive um, a, a, a natural disaster doesn't mean that they're thriving and they'd like to be able to thrive. And so um, they don't, often people don't want resilient, their own resilience to be used as an excuse for not providing them with, with services and, and helping them better prepare for future disasters. So I'll just mention that. Um, the things that we really noticed uh, at were, and this is, we're looking at the household level, right? So some of the things that we've noticed is that 
individuals really can make a difference. So um, uh, individual community leaders can make a big difference in terms of raising awareness and education in, in garnering support from other community members to, to proactively do things like raise the level of um, shelters or platforms to create evacuation centers that are um, safe from floods. Um, there's all kinds of exam positive ex examples of um, people taking individual actions, whether for their household or at the community level, that improve or increase the resilience of a particular community. Um, and there's lots of examples of people beginning to try to, to work across um, uh, disciplines. And so recently, for example, uh, we worked with colleagues from Mindanao State University in Iligan City um, to host a workshop that looked at the intersection of conflict, climate change, and the environment. And there we had some fantastic scholars, um, practitioners working for community-based organizations and other NGOs, um, uh, really thinking about and looking at ways to leverage their own expertise from di different disciplines, to leverage the their own um, experiences within communities that they were working with. So they were working on some of the on some of the same issues, but from very different vantage points. So some from a climate adaptation lens some from a, a peace and security lens and others from more humanitarian and, and development angle. And even getting those communities to begin to speak to one another can really enhance um, coordination and, and thereby um, improve resilience in those communities as well. But, but there are lots of positive uh, examples. Uh, there's, no, there's no question. And there's a spirit of, um, and one of the things I'm actually quite curious about is how this would play out in, in the data, but there's of course the spirit of, of um, neighborly help in, in the Philippines, um, um, the term bayanihan, which is, you know, plays out at a very local level in terms of um, people helping one another um, to prepare for, uh, respond to and recover from, from disasters. But again, you know, there's that difference between expectations about who should be preparing or responding and who actually does. And, and there needs to be some bringing together um, of policy and preparation with community experience. Thank you. And so our um, researchers at NERFs are really interested in this positive examples. And uh, we are really striving to highlight this um, existing practices that many other communities can learn from. We have two more questions, uh, but more technical question about the data collection. You have mentioned earlier that you are already at the stage of uh, doing your research in Nepal related to this. Um, the question is, um, what are the other countries that you're planning to do this kind of survey? That's the first one. And the second one, um, also, I think it's very interesting because during your presentation, I was actually thinking, what is the Filipino translation of climate change? <laughs> So the question by Christian Kyle Balange, uh, how were the skills of measurement given to the Filipino respondents? Were they translated in English or other forms? Yeah, um, so great questions. Uh, so we are working in, we, we're continuing to do most of our work in the Philippines. So we will be doing another nationwide survey there. Um, hopefully this it gets underway this year. Um, we um, work with a local um, polling organization that has enumerators or data collectors that are um, located across the country. Um, we work with those enumerators to train them on the survey instrument that we develop. The survey instrument that we developed is based on a couple of things. One, the literature. So how have people measured disaster preparedness and resilience in the research um, and in the literature? But also we work directly with um, local uh, experts from civil society, private sector, government, um, across the board to make sure that the questions that we are asking are locally contextually relevant. And then we include different scales or measures that we're interested in. So for example, we look, well, we're interested in mental health and this connection between mental health and um, I mentioned how important self-efficacy was. So there's this there is some link between mental health uh, and engagement in preparedness activities. And that's something we want to better understand. There's also clearly a link and increasingly the use of scales that measure climate anxiety. And so one of the positive things that we were hoping to do is to look at um, the sort of the, the opposite of that as efficacious measures people can take 
things that contribute to them feeling like they can do something uh, at, at an individual level and, and how that links up with their own um, actual engagement and preparedness. We're also looking at persons with, uh, ho hoping to include, we're going to include a scale in, in term with looking at persons with disabilities and how persons with disabilities are affected by, impacted by um, disaster and how that is different from the uh, general population or how it compares to the general population. So we will continue to do that work in the Philippines. We also have done some work in Bangladesh, um, looking at uh, coastal uh, resilience, looking at impacts of sea level rise and increasing soil salinity. Um, I mentioned earlier that we are going to be doing research in Nepal as well. We just completed a, a scoping study uh, to look at some of the national capacities and areas that could could benefit from research. And so we're trying to figure out exactly um, what what that you know what shape that research is going to take and whether we're going to look at, for example, flooding in one region versus <clears throat> as a colleague mentioned earlier from his work in in Nepal, um, um, the the GLOF, the uh, glacial um, lake um, outburst. Uh, so we we just haven't decided, you know, exactly where our research can have the greatest greatest impact, but but we will do that in the coming months. Super exciting, and so and we look forward to the uh, results of those uh, future research activities. Uh, we still have a lot of questions from our online audience, but I really encourage those who are attending in person to also provide your crucial interventions in this discussion. Right. Um, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, and Masa Kondi from uh, Hiroshima University. Um, I specialize in climate change and biogeochemistry. And uh, uh, my concern is that how local people are aware of uh, uh, actual climate change, the impact of climate change. Because uh, whatever the natural disaster may not due to climate change it's due to uh, natural climate variability so whatever uh, the awareness of climate change may not be uh, necessarily uh, linked to the uh, you know the impact of disaster for example southeast asian country is susceptible to uh, el nino southern oscillation so it's, mm -hmm. it's a natural cycle el nino la nina it's a natural cycle and of course uh what was that uh the mega fire in uh, Australia a few years back is not due to climate change, it's due to a uh, combination of natural climate cycles. So it's, my point is that nowadays everybody think uh, extreme events are due to climate change. That's not the truth. So I, I was wondering the local people are aware of that kind of uh, uh, differences. Yeah, no, I mean, of course you, you can't point to anyone disaster and say that this is the result of, of climate change. You can create a, a model and say climate change impacts make the likelihood of a particular kind of disaster whatever percentage more likely. But there's no way that you can point to any one disaster and say, oh, climate, this is climate change um, for sure. Um, but you can say on the aggregate, the climate is changing, temperature is rising, sea levels are rising. As a result of sea levels are rising, Places are flooding much more frequently than they used to. So certainly we can say that on the aggregate, climate change is having an impact, but a particular flood or, you know, it might be, it might be because of, um, you know, a, a storm that happened to coincide with a high tide that happened to, it can be the result of so many different factors. And of course is the result of many different factors. Um, I think at the end of the day, it people are wondering about how they, how they're going to deal with what they know is going to happen. They're going to be impacted by some sort of natural hazard. They may not care whether it's it's due to climate change or not. I think governments are thinking about how to think about or model the but the potential impacts, which honestly, I, I don't even know how effective these models are, given that there isn't preceding data that these models can be built off of to really predict exactly what's going to happen, because it's assuming that what's happened before is simply going to increase by that percentage more. But if if the dynamics themselves are completely different, 
then maybe the, you know the models won't even be effective in predicting. So it's it's really hard to 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 assess. And I I do completely agree that while we know that climate change on aggregate is having significant negative impacts um, globally, and is related to increased frequency and increased severity of of natural events, we can't say that any one natural event is the product of climate change. Right, thank you. Thank you. We also have students here in, in the room. Um, if you, you have some reflections that you'd like to share, you know, this disaster has happened everywhere, um, especially in many countries in the region. So if you also have some questions or uh, reflections that you'd like to share uh, for this discussion, I encourage you to do so. And if you could please introduce your name and where you're from, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, um, Doctor. Um, my name is Taufik Hida, I'm from Indonesia. Um, my research um, nothing to do with climate change. Um, my research was film. But um, when it comes to climate change, um, things that come to my mind and um, to see the, what happened in Indonesia, um, people are not aware of this, especially the local people, because um, I think you mentioned that, um, that people are not aware because they're thinking of something to fulfill the basic needs. And we have been living in this condition for a very long time. But then what, um, when it comes to make a huge change, I always think that the industrial uh, aspect would do bring such a huge impact. I mean, um, right that we have to uh, bring the awareness to the local people and see how they do understand, whether they do understand what's happening and what's going to happen later. But then these big companies, for example, they play a very important role. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to mention the example that's happening now in Indonesia that people are not aware of the effect, uh, especially in Jakarta, the capital city. We are now talking about the air pollution. And a lot of people um, now really realize that this is really happening because we can see that. A lot of people take pictures of that and post it on social media. But then when some um, local media try to trace um, where is exactly the, um, 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 the source of these things happen, it's, of course, it's from the people because we... Uh, we commute with 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 um, cars and and motorcycles, but then the um, the factory around are contributing to this, and the fact that they actually contribute a huge amount of um, 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 factors to to the situation. So, what's your take on this? I mean, you um, your research uh, better to to uh, more to to the local people to to bring the awareness, but um, do you think um that would i'm not i'm not i'm not being very i'm not i'm not trying to be negative here but then mm -hmm. if the local people are, are do understand what's going to happen in fact they might be the first person to get affected yeah but then how much do you think that would change the situation later yeah no i, I so our our focus has been on how people are um, thinking about and experiencing disaster and how they can be better prepared um, for, for future disasters and how can organizations that support them, whether local government or civil society organizations can help them at the same time adapt to some of the changes and mitigate some of the impacts. Um, so we haven't looked at um, any individual's contribution to, for example, global climate change through, through emissions. Clearly, um, the impact of private sector of industry is is enormous, and its innovations and in technologies in those areas that I think hold the greatest promise for hopefully reducing some um, greenhouse gas emissions and mitigating some of the impacts um, of uh, those emissions on on contributing to um, uh, global temperature rise. But that. You know how quickly that can happen, as opposed to how we begin to feel the impacts of that temperature 
I think is difficult to say for sure. Um, it's hard to know when an innovation is going to come and how how significant an impact it, it will have um, in mitigating some of those impacts and, and in lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And also there are potentially negative impacts from some of the some of the substitute um, technologies that we're looking at. So for example, you know, the the move to electric cars is fantastic, but you need to get all of these minerals out of the earth. And so that has the potential for both positively increasing livelihoods, but negatively harming the environment and under undermining people's ability to deal with um, both climate change impacts and 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 environmental degradation impacts. And so there's no, you know, there's there's obviously no simple answer to this. And it's really hard to tell anyone. It, and of course we live in in a system, international system of sovereign states, which um, can agree um, in principle to reduce emissions, but in practice may find it difficult to do so. And every country has to weigh its own national interests, its own economic growth, its own demands of its own citizens with a country, a, a feeling of um, responsibility towards um, lowering greenhouse gas emissions and trying to begin to mitigate the impacts of, of uh, future climate change. It's tough. That's there's going to be no no simple answer. Hopefully, there's enough innovation in technology to to really make um, a significant difference. And people are innovative. Um, the question is, can it happen fast enough? Is it going to just get more of it? I, I mentioned before that my research was about film, but um, it reminds um, when when it come when we talk about climate change, um, it reminds me of the film. I think it's. It was released in 2022. Um, Don't Look Up is on Netflix, but it's not about climate change. It's kind of like bringing another um, issue. Um, um, the main, the main um, antagonist was played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and he was very much into this issue. Um, yeah. the, the story goes into you know this professor trying to remind people that the comet is coming, but some media tried to see what's um, can we talk about this in a light way, not make people, <laughs> right. not make people scary, uh, scared of the, what, what's happening, or trying yeah. to make it as a sweet talk rather than as a warning? As mm -hmm. an expert, um, do you try when we talk to when you talk to the local people, not to um, to university? Do you do you tend to bring this as as something that you have to be scared of or? To try to educate them and try not to talk about, you know, the real world thing by you going around. And, yeah. We don't really try to to tell them anything. We really try to listen and understand what their perspectives are and translate that information back to local government, national government, and other organizations that are involved in preparedness measures. So we're not instructing or teaching or doing any kind of awareness raising, we do two things. One is to listen to them and try to understand their own perspectives. And then we go back to those communities to ask them once we have data and information to help us interpret that data. So going back to um, Professor Hibiki's question about like, why why does, you know, why do they do, why do families do planning and, and training, but not material investment? Well, maybe it's because they just don't have the economic capacity, but they can do a training program that's sponsored by the local government. So we, we ask them to help us interpret that data so that we can then further translate that back to organizations that can make a difference. Um, where we do do some, this is unrelated, well, it's got some relation, but we do uh, a training program, a leadership training program for national non-governmental organizations as well. And there we do provide a kind of a, a leadership training that it allow, that provides sort of the soft skills that people at the local level can use to help them address uh, major challenges. And there we do more, more sort of teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Taufik San, for bringing that very important perspective. I think this kind of echoes the general frustration of the young people about um, climate inaction. Um, so um, thank you for putting that forward. Um, and also your last um, 
comment, um, Enzo, about the need to, you know, how our research will really translate into um, policy uh, implementation. I think that's also very crucial and something that we really strive to do at NERPS as well through our transdisciplinary uh, research activities and educational activities, activities to bring in those stakeholders outside the university for a more integrated approach. Final question. I know we have a lot of questions. Thank you for those who raised those questions. We will make sure that we'll keep these questions for um, uh, Dr. Bolatino to think about later, maybe for your future re research and your collaborators as well. But just final question. I think this is very suitable as a last question for this uh, webinar. Do you think the Philippines is now more prepared in times of disasters? Um, I think there that the Philippines is making is absolutely making strides um to prepare better prepare for future disasters. I think that the um 2013 typhoon Haiyan was a real turning point um and that significant efforts have been made in various sectors of society, in private sector for sure, um, but also at the community level and also at the national government level um, to really focus on improving practices around around preparedness and response. So there's there's no question in in my mind that that significant improvements have been made. Of course, there's room for further improvement, and that's you know exactly where we're hoping to be involved, at least in terms of the research side of things and being able to provide data that that can support those efforts. Um, so um, I'm encouraged um, by what I see and experience um, in terms of actors in the Philippines being being engaged, and especially the youth um, and. Uh, are are really um, highly motivated um, and take to social media and they organize and they they really do make an impact. So, yeah, I'm I'm very encouraged by by what I've seen um, since 2015 when when I first started working in the, in the Philippines. Thank you, and so um, it's reassuring, and I also share the same um, feeling of encouragement as a Filipino. Before I conclude this webinar, do you have any final remarks to our participants? Um, just to say that it, it was a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of being invited and to say that um, research is fundamental. It's truly important. Um, and um, anything that can be done to link um, solid academic research to, to policy and, and program implementation is good, um, whether it's primary research or evaluation of, of existing sort of policies and programs. Um, it's really important in universities uh, and academics have a really important role to play in uh, preparing um, uh, for uh, improved ability to prepare for and respond to future disasters and to mitigate and adapt to some of the impacts of climate change. Exactly. Thank you, Enzo, for sharing your insights with us today. Um, thank you to all, all our participants online and in person. And I also want to, again, uh, remind everybody that the deadline for abstract submission to our NERPS conference is this October 15. So if you have all this uh, research topics related to climate change and disasters, very much welcome for uh, to submit your abstracts and you can visit our website uh, for more details about this. And if you're also not following us through our social media, please follow us so you can uh, stay tuned for our uh, future activities. And I hope that we'll see you again in our future events. Uh, colleagues and friends, uh, join me in thanking again Akira Hibiki Sensei for the discussion, uh, Pateko Sensei for the welcome remarks, and of course, our special guest, Dr. Bolatino, for this insightful presentation. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you, Enzo. Bye-bye.